All right, so this topic is about post-exploitation, which is uh, basically what happens next. So we've managed to find out information about the system. We've managed to find a way of hacking into the system, compromising the security of the system. Um, we now have access to this machine that we have um, you know, managed to um, break into. What can we do? Go, where can we go from there? So, you know, we've at this point, um, post exploitation is all about what we do after successfully um, exploiting systems. So, what do you think an attacker would do um, after compromising a computer? Maybe solve a pile of work. Victory parade. Yeah. Yeah. Pat on the back. Yeah. Celebrate. Yeah, leave themselves yeah back door so they can get access again at a later date. Yeah. Pivoting to other systems. Good. Delete log files. Yeah. Create an admin themselves. Yeah, create an admin account for themselves. Yeah. So the same, you know, give themselves a way of getting in later. Um, but yeah, just give themselves a, an admin admin access. Anything else? Alright, those, those are some, those are actually really good points, all of which I'm about to cover. So, yeah, that's good. So, you know, one of the most basic things that we can do is actually just start gathering more information. So, we've broken into a system. Uh, the next step is actually, usually, find out more about the system that we've just broken into for a few reasons. Um, you know, well, why do you think we might want to know about this, the computer in more detail that we've just managed to break into? Yeah. Yeah. So looking for like specific information that we're targeting off their computer. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, looking for further vulnerabilities. Good, really good. So, um, and okay, so we've got access to the machine. We might also want to grab a copy of data that's on the machine. You get that information and get a copy of it onto my own machine. So I'm going to start downloading stuff. Um, off the machine that we've compromised, making various modifications. So obviously, if we've broken into like a bank, for example, an attacker might want to change their bank balance, for, you know, for example, uh, or just like um, I don't know, maybe vandalizing a website, you know, changing the website so that it says you've been hacked or something, I don't know, whatever. Uh, um, <coughs> so you might, you know, as as you said, you might go for further attacks to see if I can. You can actually <coughs> escalate your privileges, um, or look, start looking at attacking other systems that you can get to from that machine you've just broken into. Denial of service. You might just actually stop them from being able to do stuff. Maybe you're just gonna, you know, wipe the computer or turn it off or make things difficult. Yeah. Can you also just like if it's a <coughs> big company? Go to Facebook or say, uh, look, I've hacked you, give me a job. <laughs> <laughs> um, the best way to get a job is going to be admitting your serious crime. Go, go it. Um, yeah, so you try and, try and um, I would advise <laughs> against that approach. Uh, so, so, are you, so you're saying go, you've hacked into the machine, use that to get yourself a job. Um, or ask for some money. Okay, so um, yeah, so uh, maybe yes. So that might be something that you want that you could do, I guess. Um, like blackmailing the organization. Um, yeah. Okay. Again, legality-wise. But then again, that's what that's what we're talking about. So yeah, yeah, that might be something that an attacker would do. Um, impersonation so you might actually be able to use that information or access to that machine to actually impersonate someone else um, that works for them or you know. so there's lots of different things and it all depends on the motivation of the attacker right so there's hacktivism which is where you're actually you're hacking for some kind of cause and you're trying to make a statement about something so 
you know, that's where like defacing website or maybe leaking information that you manage to um, get from hacking into the machine might come into it. Um, organized crime. Uh, so, for example, you know, actually trying to make money in, in a, in a um, like a premeditated way. Um, what other motivations might people have? Maybe looking for a job. <laughs> Think that they're going to get them a job. Revenge. Revenge. Somebody's gone into page shell websites, so you turn around and try and go at theirs. Uh huh. Yeah. So yeah. So just um, a, like a re related thing would be like a disgruntled employee, yeah. someone who's been fired or something like that, who maybe knows a bit about the system, and um, I don't know. Like, say for example, you work in a company. It's not that unusual for them to like tell people what the root password for a server is and they don't change it necessarily every time someone gets fired. Uh, so you could do like a lot of damage really easily. Um, obviously if they're doing security better than that they would, wouldn't be just handing out the root password to everyone in the organization. Um, but yeah it happens. So it all depends like what it, what's possible depends on what kind of access you manage to get from hacking into the system right because you don't necessarily end up with full root privileges every single time. Um, but what you, often what the aim is is to end up with a shell. So you end up with shell access, which basically allows you to run commands on that server, um, which would allow you to modify and read some files usually. Um, so that's kind of what you're aiming for. You don't always end up with shell, but uh, often, often you do. And then the next thing is to figure out whether or not you've got root, right? So if you've got root access, then you're basic. You're an administrator on the server, and you can basically do anything on that server. Um, you know, usually, unless there are other controls in place. So um, the first step is to figure out what user context you're running in. So a, on like a Windows or a Linux Unix server, what user is, is this software that I've just broken into running as? and therefore what can I do on the system? What other security um, restrictions might be in place? You know, if things are done really well, there might be some sandboxing in place or like really good access control configuration. Um, often, often, that's not the case. So um, the most amount of access will come from having administrator access. So if you end up with a super, use, super user, um, which just means like, either administrator or root depending on if we're talking about Windows or Linux. If you've got super user access you can do basically anything on the machine. So on a Windows system if our um, SID ends with the number 500 then that means that we are a um, administrator or if we've got system access and on Unix uh, we're root if our UID is zero. So we want to find out information about our security context and that'll tell us what we can do. So on Unix you can use the command who am I um, which will tell you your username, so in this case Cliff, uh, and ID will tell you your UID, GID, groups. Um, so if, for example, this came back as zero, then I'm like, oh, I'm root, I can do anything. I'm currently running as a normal user, so there are restrictions in place on what, what that user can do. Um, so on a related note, um, when should you log into a graphical, like, computer log in as root, uh, just like log into a, a, a Linux machine um, into KDE or whatever your desktop is as root. When should you do that? Never, never is the correct answer. Should never ever ever um, log in as the root user because there's just so much can go wrong, right? Either accidentally because you just do something and you know, it doesn't even prompt you, it'll just happily obey your commands and like wipe the entire hard drive. But also if there is any if there are any security problems with the software that you're running, once they hack into that, they've got access to the entire system. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of damage they can do with access to your user account, but slightly less than access to, to root. Uh, an ID will just um, you know give you all all of that details and you can also tell it to just tell you the, the user UID if that's what you want. So um, there are access controls in place. 
Um, <clears throat> if you type cat, so printing the contents of a pay of a, a file via log messages, if you are a normal user, then uh, it'll actually just say permission denied. You can't do that, so you have to actually be root in order to access certain files on the system. So, what if they did manage to get access, say, to my user account on my computer, but not root? You know, what sort of damage can happen at that point? So what, what could you do without root access, but with access to someone's user account? Well, it depends if you use it as part of Wheel as well. Yes, that's true. Um, yeah. So assuming that there's no automatic way that gives the user root access. You can send in the whole root directory by user. A simple user, you can send in the whole root directory, which you can just read file, read and file, which lets you read and file. Sorry? You can send in the whole root directory by just a simple user, and then you can read any file. You can what link, sir? Simlink. Simlink. Yeah. Um. Because because of the permissions, like you know, there are some permissions which uh, which you won't be able to see by shell. But if you simlink, then you can do yeah. that. Uh. Like you can do it over FTP. Um, I've had that before where I've been logged in as a low privilege user and I've been able to look through all your directories yeah. but not be able to modify anything. Yeah. Uh, but so I can obviously see that they exist. Yeah, okay. So a, a symlink shouldn't give you any extra access other than maybe navigating somewhere where you can't normally navigate out of. So I guess like if you have FTP and in something. Of but it systems, the, you could like you, you could just read any yeah. file like you, you could just read a shadow file. Yeah. So, well, no, you shouldn't be able to read the shadow file if you're a normal user. Um, the even if you create a symlink, because the symlink doesn't change your permissions on a file. But what you can do as a normal user is often browse any file. Um, most files in an operating system you'll have read access to, so you can still read information about the operating system and everything, but you can't write to it. You can read the password file, which includes a list of users but not the shadow file which includes the hashed password so you do need to be root to do that and a symlink will give you like a pointer at a place to look at but it won't give you extra permissions it might allow you to navigate out of something um, but you know so what else what else could a user do as a user on a system Yes, which can be a lot, right? So that, so you, you might have access to their entire like web history. You've got all of their personal documents. You've got like all the access to all their emails if they're using an email client. You've got, um, you know, a lot of stuff potentially that you've now got access to, and you don't need to root for any of that. Like, root access is helpful if you want to change the operating system. But in fact, if you're just interested in the information on the system, you might not even care about having root. So there are like you know, if you do hit upon the right user on that system, then you might have access to a whole bunch of stuff that's interesting. If you get access to the wrong user on that system, then you might find very little. So for example, Apache will usually run as a separate user that's just for Apache, and if you get access to that, then that might be a lot of interesting stuff, but it might not be everything that you're interested in that's on that computer. So um, so yeah, there. Are, and what, what other... Um, Restrictions might there be on the computer that will stop what you can do in addition to um, just the standard access control stuff that we're talking about? Firewall. Firewalls, yeah. So firewall uh, might stop you from using um, network traffic in various ways. So for example, you could set up Apache so that it's running in its own user and you could set firewall rules that say that user is only allowed to access certain ports um, which would limit the, what you could do if, once you end up as that user. Um, sandboxes is also another thing so you might be in like a CH route which is like a gives you a limited view of the file system so it, what you see as root might not actually be the root of the computer um, you might be like running inside an isolated container. Um, <clears throat> you know, you might be in Docker or like a virtual machine. Uh, you might um, 
yeah, so there's a few there's a few different things that might be in place that restrict what you can do. So that's all stuff that you want to learn about once you're packed into a machine. Like, is this a virtual machine? You know, what what do I have access to? So you can look at environment variables is also a good start. So just like E and B, which will give you a list of all the um, you know environment variables for that computer. So it'll tell you a bunch of stuff that could be quite interesting. Um, so you can see there's like there's a lot of information potentially that's in that's there. Um, you can also start looking at things like proc file system, which is basically is a pseudo file system with files that don't really exist on the hard drive. They're just files that you can access that give you information about the computer and, and processes running. So if you run proc CPU info, that's going to tell you you know stats about the machine. Like what type of CPU does it have? Um, you can look at free, which will tell you how much free memory there is on the machine, which tells you about the computer. You can look at um, you know, you could look at the um, kernel version that's running. If you use uname, it'll tell you the the um, you know the file system. Um, so um, tax surface. Once you um, break into your computer, that gives you a whole set of stuff that you can now start looking at whole set of things that you can now potentially attack. So you, before you hacked into the computer, all you could see were a bunch of ports that were open, say, and you could see that it looks like there's certain software installed. Then once you've got onto that computer, you might find a whole bunch of other stuff that you could start attacking. So um, there might be a vulnerability that you can use from being a normal user that will give you privilege escalation to becoming root, or maybe um, you know privilege escalation to become a separate user on that system. Um, you know, so there are um, you, you want to start figuring out what can I, where can I go next. Um, so in Metasploit, Metasploit framework, there are a number of um, post exploitation modules. Um, so you know we've already looked at information gathering modules. We've looked at exploitation modules. Um, you can also there are post exploitation modules which give you an automated way of doing stuff that you're interested on in once you break into the system. So once you've successfully attacked the system, you can start running post exploitation modules. And usually what they do is they take control of that shell that on that system and they will automate the process of doing stuff that you're interested in doing. So for example. There's a post exploitation module for checking whether you're in a VM, because if you're in a virtual machine, it's worth knowing about. Um, you might also want to gather information, so you know what, how is the system configured? What's the networking configuration? Do I have, you know, other networking interface card? You know, do I have a whole other IP address that I didn't know about on that machine? Maybe that'll give me a way of talking to other computers on the separate network. Um, you know what is the user history and all that sort of stuff. You can start gathering password hashes for cracking passwords. Um, so that those are all things that you can do with post exploitation modules in Metasploit. Uh, Meterpreter is an advanced payload. So we've talked about like getting shell access and having um, you know like shell on the system. We talked about bind shell and reverse shell as being two ways of doing that. But what that gives you is simply a way of running commands on that system. If you um, use an advanced payload like Meterpreter, it gives you like basically access to all these advanced features that will simplify the sorts of things that you want to do once you break into that system. So um, Meterpreter was originally developed by Matt Miller, also known as Scape, and it, it runs in memory entirely in memory without ever touching the hard drive. So if you get a meterpreter shell, you, you don't actually, you haven't actually changed anything on the disk. Uh, and from there, you can actually migrate meterpreter into an existing process that's already running on that computer. So for example, you can migrate that program that's running into, a, um, into Explorer or Internet Explorer, or you know anything that's already running on that system. So what do you think that means for like forensics? If we're trying to figure out what's going on on a computer, what does that mean? Why is it interesting? <coughs> it's 
Sorry. It's bloody hard to see it's running. It's bloody hard to see see what's going on if if the if after breaking into the computer the stuff that you're doing can come from any program that's already on that computer you can just migrate all this all of these activities to coming from this other program then yeah it's really hard to figure out what's going on also if you turn the computer off what do you think you know you can know by looking at the hard drive very little right like you don't know, there's no way of knowing what the processes were that were running on the system you might see what's changed which files have changed on the computer but figuring out how it happened and how we got there is very difficult. Yeah. So it's quite tricky. The, the mm. So um, also the traffic between the attacker and the compromised system, the traffic in Meterpret is all encrypted as well. So unlike like a, re a simple bind shell or, or reverse shell, where if you had Wireshark on the network, you could see all the commands being typed in. With um, Meterpreter, by listening to the network traffic, you can't really tell anything. It's just some, you see some encrypted traffic, which might be suspicious, but also you know it's, might not be depending on what port it's on. You know, so it can you know it can be quite uh, it's quite a powerful tool, put it that way. So, Meterpret is a staged payload. So, you know, it's a really simple shell. You can fit that code, the entire like bind shell or reverse shell into a buffer in a program. So, you know, if we're talking about a buffer overflow, usually it gives us some space in memory that we can dump some code and somehow end up running that code on, the, on that system. Um, a staged payload basically means that you're loading up something a bit more that can normally fit within that space in memory. Uh, so you basically, you get the, um, the staged payload, so you have a stager and that pulls down the rest of the payload over the network. Um, the stage, and then that gets executed. So, um, so that's how um, interpreter works. So you end up with, um, you know, um, something bigger than will fit into the um, the buffer. Uh, so there's all sorts of things you can do with interpreter. So you can use spyware. So there's key logging. So you can just start listening into things that are being typed onto the computer. Uh, you can do screen capture. So you can just grab a screenshot of what's currently being displayed on that computer at that time. Uh, you can um, easily use system commands like ls to list, you know, list um, the files and directories. ps to list like processes on the system. You can get uid, uh, which is quite handy on like a Windows system where it can be a bit finicky to find that information out from the command prompt. But from a interpreter, you just type get uid and it will tell you what user context you're running as. Uh, so very, very, very powerful. Um, you can quite easily download and upload files more easy than if you've got simple shell. So if you've just got command line access, you can do all these things, but it just takes more steps. So um, uploading and downloading files, you know, you could do with like using I, a, like a HTTP server or an FTP server or, or um, you know, there's various ways you can get files from one computer to another, but with Meterpreter, it just makes it really, really simple. Um, you can run post exploitation modules. So, Meterpreter has a bunch of extra, um, you know, commands that you can use to get, uh, you know, more access to more things. Pivoting, which you mentioned earlier, is very important. Very important um, thing. Basically, allows you to route attacks through the compromised system. So, if we're a network of computers, and um, you know. Wayne is the ser is like the um, basically the the gateway to the outside world. You're a router or router if you prefer, since you're English. Um, and you know you, we might have like I can't get at any of the internet systems. So all you guys are like various computers for employees. I can't directly access any of those from the internet. But if I manage to hack into um, <laughs> in, into your system, then I can basically, from there, I can pivot and basically force you to attack them for on my behalf. Um, so that's what pivoting is. Um, and if you ever just want a simple shell, just type shell, and you've got command line access to the system. So other payloads other than interpreter um, that that might be. Um, interesting is uh, VNC. 
so which will give you desktop access basically so you can just see the desktop and move, you know click with your mouse and stuff it's not normally what you want because to be honest like it's a lot easier to do stuff from interpreter than it is from like graphical interface uh, but you know it could be interesting uh, you can also basically configure the client so that you can have read-only access so for example you can see their desktop but you can't move their mouse or type in the keyboard why might that be helpful so to, to yeah spy yeah basically spy on the user so you can see what they're doing but not give away the fact that they've been hacked by just like moving their mouse around so the payload could be that you install uh, Rats and remote access to on that computer, so that you can yeah. you know that's going to have a backdoor for a long time. It's encrypted well, yeah. so for a long time you'll be able to access what they're doing. So it's a long term sort of. Yeah, project. so that's um, there are a lot of uh, like exploit um, kits that you can use to do that, or basically like a root kit where you basically install that onto this, install a root kit onto the system, and then that gives you like permanent access. To the system and hides itself from the operating system and things like that. So, as long as it's new enough that the antivirus doesn't pick it up, then um, yeah, you can basically give yourself extra access through that. Do we just a way to um, to specifically crypt a an executable in a way that an antivirus won't pick up for a long time until this specific crypt is leaked out and the and antiviruses know how to. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of ways that malware tries to hide its presence from anti-malware, and you know, you've got polymorphic viruses, for example, malware, which basically just means it cha it doesn't look the same every time, and you can use encoding methods like you looked at in week two, I think it was, where you can have like lots of different ways you can represent the same code, and it's quite difficult to detect that it's the same code. You know, also if you just wanted a tool sitting there that you only wanted to be able to activate later, you could just encrypt it, and that would be like 100% foolproof. No, if you just encrypted a file and stuck it on their computer, as long as you still got some way of getting into that system, then there's basically um, no way antivirus could pick that up. So yeah, there are various ways, um, and probably that you could just write your own ma malware, and then yeah, nothing's going to pick it up. Uh, but um, anti-malware do. do look at behavioural things to try and detect um, that something might be malware even though it hasn't seen it before but again um, they're, they're not that hard to, to fool um, so um, so yeah we're pivoting if we're routing attacks through the compromised system um, you know I think I've already kind of given that away so what you know why would an attacker want to do this well, I'll answer the question for you. <laughs> Basically, there's the stuff that you can't get at directly. Once you've hacked into a computer, you'll be able to start looking, talking to other machines and things um, that you wouldn't otherwise be able to access. Why else would you want to use pivoting? Can you think of another reason that, other than getting at something I couldn't just attack directly? Yeah. So basically, to hide my identity as an attacker, because it looks like an attack was coming from a different computer rather than myself. So, say for example, we're in a large organization. We've got a demilitarized zone, um, which has the server that you can get to from the public. There's an intranet um, that is also connected to the server. Sorry, guys. Could you um, could you s stop talking, please? Um, so if an attacker um, manages to gain control of the system, they can then start using that to start communicating with the internet and possibly attack from there. So what would log files show? In that scenario I was talking about before where um, you know, I managed to, to trick Dwayne into doing the attack for me, if we started looking at Wayne, Wayne, sorry. Um, if we looked at the log files, what would that look like? Uh-huh. Yeah. So if I wanted to make sure my tracks were covered, what do I need to do? Kill <coughs> Yeah. So um use his system through his system. Yeah. So then so if I trick Wayne into attacking Chris, for example, 
there's the if just looking at your from your perspective you can't tell that I'm involved from from Wayne's perspective maybe you could if you looked at like his log files or whatever so that's that basically if I what if I pivoted via Wayne and then Chris for example then then things get quite hard to figure out where it came from and all I need to do is make sure I cover my tracks in one spot and then it's basically you can't get back and if I try and cover my tracks in each of those places each of the pivots then it becomes really hard to figure out like where it comes because not only do you, you know it's hard to figure out who attacked Chris but from that point you'd still need to try and figure out who who attacked Wayne um, so yeah so that's another reason for pivoting so how can we do pivoting um, probably like one of the easier ways we could do it we could just upload the hacking tools um, you know if I could do all this without my interpreter for example I could just get shell on on I'm gonna break the metaphor a bit say each of you have separate computers um, I, I um, get shell on your server um, I can then just upload the hacking tools that I'm using onto your machine and then still from your command line launch them against the next machine and so on right uh, to attack different machines um, but, and that's fine but again and that's not perfect why isn't why would that not be ideal <coughs> yeah big footprint of what's going on so you can see all the tools and stuff that I'm using sitting on each of the computers right so it's not great but still you know one way of approaching it so port forwarding is another way I can do it so basically I could set up on your server so that it just automates the process of if I connect into this port then it's automatically going to connect through to a different port um, so that's another way you can do it uh, which is like an improvement because now there's no tools sitting on your computer to find uh, or I can actually set up routing uh, to basically allow me to access anything from your computer and so on so that I can basically go from automate that step so that I can, from your computer I can you know get to Chris or Ian or you know <coughs> Tim or whatever like I can get access to different machines on the, on that server uh, so Meterpreter makes you know those last two options really easy um, so covering tracks so if I want to avoid getting caught I might install like a rootkit um, which will modify the operating system on the tools on the operating system to actually hide malicious files and processes so it makes it hard to see that I'm what I've changed about the computers. Uh, it might give me, can, you know, access to it later. Um, I might try and disable, delete, or modify log files. Um, why would deleting log files actually probably not be the best way to do it? Because there will always be log files. Well, no, because then if they notice that the log files suddenly disappeared, yeah, it yeah. might look a bit suspicious yeah, if suddenly. There's ways that you can um, you can delete for a certain amount of time. There's there's two yeah. different types of logging. Yeah. So disabling logging is probably more helpful. So you just say like I'm going to turn off logging while I'm using, doing the things that, that are interesting, and then turn it on at the end. But won't it then have a log for you disabling that at some point? Possibly. Maybe. Wow. So if you just, just be able it to depends on the logging if, system. If you're but able to delete just obviously one hour of history that you yeah. on the machine. Yeah. But then know you want. But if yeah. you disabled it, and then there's an hour gap, like what happened? Yeah. Yeah. So basically, being intelligent about what you get rid of from log files so that it doesn't look suspicious. You can use anti-forensics, so you can use steganography, which is where you hide information within information. So I might have like all my tools actually stored within an image or, you know, like a, like a JPEG image or saving information in ways that it's not obvious that that's what it is. Um, modifying timestamps. So a lot, the way that a lot of forensic stuff works, and you'll know this from the forensic modules, is to actually look at the history of what's happened on that computer. But that's just all zeros and ones on the hard drive, right? So you can change all that information. So if you want to try and cover your tracks, you change the dates of the file access times and things like that, so that you've accessed these files and uh, actually it was accessed three days ago. You know, you change that information so that a forensic investigator wouldn't be able to determine when it was accessed accurately or just zeroing out a disk because you know, pretty hard to recover from that so maintaining access I might leave myself a user account to get in later leave a back door so some way you know as 
as James said, some way of getting back onto the system and send, running commands. Um, and if you do break in, you might actually fix the original security problem that got you there in the first place just so that if you're doing a security audit of the system later, you don't pick up the fact that it was so insecure at all to start with. So there's all sorts of things that can happen after you've been hacked. We don't have time to talk about it now, but obviously in the news recently, there's been a whole bunch of um, stuff happening in the last couple of years. A lot of it very high profile. There's some very famous hacks that have happened. Uh, some of the things on the screen there can give you a few hints, but the, you know, a lot happens. So in conclusion, um, once an exploit is successful, it's basically the beginning of the end. So the attack is won. You can make the system do things it's not meant to do. You can start reading and modifying files. You can compromise confidentiality, integrity, or availability. Um, you might be able to get even more privilege on the system and launch further attacks. Um, and obviously, as security professionals, we try to avoid all of this from happening. But it does. So we need to plan for how we actually respond to these kind of incidents when they do happen and try and investigate as well as we can, can to figure out what's happened and you know, recover. Uh, so that's the end of the, of the topic. Thanks, guys.